Hello. Today I chat with Min Kim, who was an investor with On Deck and Bloomberg Beta, and now leads this awesome thing called Dialogue, which is like a community, just like community hangout stuff. And I go to their writing club here in San Francisco, which is really fun. And she, we talk a lot about that, this like community and entrepreneurship and how they kind of connect to each other and how she brings together just practitioners who are doing robotics or biotechnology or whatever it may be, and how those kind of ecosystems kind of self-propagate very powerful um, communities and, and then the kind of outputs of those communities, these dents in the universe. So that is mostly what we talked about today, which is really juicy. And, and if you want to learn about how men thinks about community, this is a great episode to do so. She also, we also talked about her, actually her main, her day job these days, which is called Plymouth, uh, which is a way to help high skilled labor uh, get visas in the US. And so these are O1 visas. And it is just like <laughs> the US immigration system, the whole way down is extremely frustrating. Um, and it's just men's working to us to uh, beat it, which is really, really sweet. And so starting to make it more transparent, faster, all these things. Um, we learned a little bit about Plymouth and how she's kind of helping make uh, US high skilled immigration uh, better because it went from 11 million to 3 million um, in, in, after the Trump administration. So it's like, we need to get that thing back up to, to 10 million and actually to something more like 100 million. So um, excited for all of that and uh, it's connection to the abundance agenda and enjoy today's episode with men. Thanks. Hello, Reese's Pieces. I'm Reese, the co-founder of Root, and welcome to The Reese Show. I believe the best way to predict the future is to build it. And so I'm interviewing pioneers on the frontier to understand what the world will look like and the secrets behind how they're building it. These are insights from the frontier. And today I'm excited to chat with Min Kim. Min is an early stage investor who's invested at Bloomberg Beta and on deck. And under Dialogue, she runs this great set of community events in SF in New York. And I sometimes go to her writing clubs on Wednesdays or on Sunday, sorry, which is great. Uh, and then she's also the co-founder of this thing called Plymouth Street, which offers offers personalized visa um, U.S. visa support for the world's top STEM talent. Min, thanks for being on the show and welcome. Hi, Reese. It's so nice to be on. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have you. And, and I like folks, and I even got this energy from you during our little um, podcast pre-convo where it's like, it just like you can just taste what people are like extremely curious about things and also extremely energetic. And so Min was talking about how <laughs> she was writing this 500 page report. And then she was also talking about how she was really excited by Eleanor Roosevelt and all this stuff. And so it's kind of like trying to capture somebody in 45 minutes is hard, but um, we'll do our best today. Amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm, uh, you gave such a beautiful intro, um, and then so take me wherever it yeah, makes yeah, sense yeah. to. But, yeah, and so yeah. where we, I want to, I just want to start, man, with like, you know, and you kind of, um, I think people have these like um, interesting life stories that are that actually have through lines through them. So, do you want to just start by saying like, what is the, uh, what's the through line behind your work, and and how has it looked in the past kind of decade or two? It is very timely that you ask. Um, I've been building something of my own for the last uh, five, six months now. And that question has been very top of mind for me. Um, just like really digging in and asking myself, like, why does this matter? Why do I care so much? Um, and I think the through line for me is I have been bringing people together and enabling entrepreneurship for the better part of a decade and arguably what feels like my whole life. Um, so I'm a South Korean immigrant. I grew up in Seoul. My whole family's from Seoul. And my parents are serial entrepreneurs. And we were the first in our family to move from South Korea to the US. And it didn't really dawn upon me how, like, what an incredible, like, story um, my parents have and how much of that's influenced my own trajectory and my own career ambitions um, until like more recently as I've like grown into adulthood and really started to like ask myself some deeper questions about like, who am I? <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, my parents are two like incredible people who are my heroes and um, watching their in, like immigrant entrepreneurship journey has certainly uh, influenced my own. Cool. And what, um, so it's like, yeah, and you have this kind of, 
you know, bringing, you know, a community or entrepreneurship through community or something like that is, is like the, the a yeah. through line. And so tell us more about this, um, uh, the, you know, your parents as these role models and, and actually men and I were chatting about before the show, Eleanor Roosevelt and how like matriarchs are very helpful in society yeah. and stuff like that. So like, and, and you said that you had these powerful matriarchs that were good models for you. Tell us about like what your parents or grandmother or mothers were as, as role models and how that kind of impacted you. Well, I was raised by my grandmother because both my parents were working when I was born. And then when I moved and then my parents um, met when they were in college and then got married like a year later and then like a year later, like had me. Um, and then a couple years after that, uh, moved to the States. And I think back to what what a giant risk that must have been for my mother um, in marrying this man who was like kind of crazy and like started a company and was like, I'm going to move to the US um, where I don't know anybody, um, don't speak the language and you're going to, you know, we're going to go together and we're going to build, we're going to raise our family here. And I think there are genuinely like moving stories about um, individuals and families who've moved here because they're escaping from, you know, like war or like conflict in their um, in their home countries. But for us, it was like very much the American dream. Like we came here to thrive, um, not just survive. And I think um, so much of my childhood and early adolescence was defined by having really strong role models in my parents um, and my mother in particular and my grandmother where uh, they really set the tone for nothing is owed to you. Um, you build, like you reap what you sow um, and everything, like we are here because we're here to earn our futures, right? And I think that that mentality and that cultural attitude is something that um, I like carry with me. Um, and it's very reminiscent to like my other like historical hero, Eleanor Roosevelt, who also happens to, I think, have this like very salt of the earth type attitude about like nothing is owed to you. And, um, you know, it is like it, it is your responsibility and you are accountable to your actions and being a being a role model in your community. And if you can't be a role model in your community, then who are you to aspire to be a role model or an influence like on anybody else? Right. You have to like take ownership over your life and the people right directly around you first. Hmm, cool yeah interesting it's like so hey it's 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 awesome that um and i like the yeah survivors is thrive um things so that's yeah that's why people move here sometimes like yeah you're running away from stuff and sometimes you're moving every you know one of my mentors has always talked about um this guy zach niece like a fro too you're always moving from something and towards something and um and so you guys were more the towards you know and in the, the kind of like you got to earn it and you got it and i think about you know um my sometimes i think about you know myself or whatever it's like do i have actually I don't know. I, don't, I mean, I mean, the, the thing that someone might is, there's some kind of like classic immigrant story there. There might be a classic kind of Asian mm -hmm. story there. Like as, for me, as like a random white dude born in America, I'm kind yeah. of just like I'm just like a cis white hetero rich, you know, upper class. Just like I was just everything was given to me. And so I think I but I think there's some truth to that, which is just like when you when you are born in um abundance or whatever you kind of don't need to earn your way you kind of were already given a platter <laughs> you just kind of accept it for what it or is on the flip side yeah i mean on the flip side i can say that i think right now we're in this like beautiful cultural shift i think about you know derek thompson at the atlantic writes a lot about like the abundance agenda and a very good friend of mine noah smith is like a brilliant economist who also writes a lot about these topics and um i think for the people who were born here you know um in contrast to the traditional immigrant story, it's recognizing that freedom and uh, like uh, and and abundance and like um, and like the gift that is uh, like the country that we live in is um, has to be protected, right? And so and has to be continuously invested in and nurtured. Um, and so we can't just rest on our laurels and ex assume that I don't know, like construction doesn't need to happen anymore, because like, we already have buildings and homes. It's like, no, that's not, you know, generation after generation, like we have we have to persist in building like literally building. <laughs> yes, totally. Yeah. And I think I think it's like kind of like a constant um, raise the bar energy where you need to, yeah. And, and, and for people, for listeners who haven't checked it out, we've had some past, um, podcasts with Yimby folks and whatever, but yeah, the abundance agenda, abundance, um, economy, all that is very, that will be a good thing that is happening within, uh, the U S government, uh, both at the California, San Francisco, and then hopefully, you know, federal level, which will be very juicy. And, and it's, I think, yes, yeah, this kind of thing where it's like when you're, 
even when you're given like a life that's pretty good, you're in America. It's like, no, you need to consistently raise the bar and be like, no, we can actually do amazing things. And like, let's dream ambitiously and then kind of make that happen. So tell me, Eleanor Roosevelt, how did, what was, what was her, I know very little about Eleanor Roosevelt and that's, the listeners, I'm not sure if they do either. What, what was her deal and why, how was she, she was like, pull yourself up by her bootstraps kind of person or what was, why do you, why is she a, a mentor? Oh, um, I mean, I won't, uh, she has, there are some very great biographies written about her, um, so I will not do them justice, but high level, I'd say she reimagined, she, she did not want to be first lady, um, when FDR became president, um, she felt that it, the role was not her, um, and so she reinvented it. She, she recognized the importance of, you have to do the thing where you are playing hostess and you're um, inviting like all the delegates to the White House and, you know, being like proper, you know, in that role. And she was also incredibly active as a community leader, as a civic, uh, civil rights activist. Um, at times, she publicly disagreed with her husband. Um, and then she herself went on campaigns and um, represented him in his stead while he was really sick. And so she really just uh, reimagined like that role, um, for like, for the country. Um, she was like beloved by like everybody basically. Um, and she was both an impressive mother, like community leader, activist, and like politician of her own. She ran, uh, she ran like a magazine at, when she was a first lady. Um, she was an editor of uh, like several different papers. Um, she wrote a book um, while she was on campaign, um, like a 40,000 word book. Um, Jesus. And so uh, I just find her like an incredibly interesting, impressive woman. Cool. Yeah. And it's cool also, I mean, especially, and things were always more difficult back then where it's like, and you know, I think about someone like Michelle Obama and, you know, Michelle Obama has a lot of that energy where she's like, yo, we actually are going to totally. try to like fight obesity people. We are actually going to do all these things. And she wasn't just like the, oh, here's like um, Obama's side piece or, you know, it's like, no, it's like yeah, Michelle yeah. Obama's a beast, you know? Totally, totally. I, I, I mean, and like, there's a time and place, I think, of recognizing like when you need to play like um, perhaps a plus one role. And then when you, in your own accord, show up as like the leader in that room, right? And I, I think there's just like a beautiful balance that some people strike um, when it comes to that. Michelle Obama yeah, was yeah. a great one too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's let's kind of um, zoom out back to the kind of your kind of through line of community through on you know entrepreneurship through the community or community through entrepreneurship or you know the, the co-evolving feedback loop between those things um tell me more about like i guess like you're bringing you have these event series that like bring people together you've done this investing at these other places um i guess i just want to start with like how do you think about community and how do you think about entrepreneurship and how do they kind of lead into each other i think that they for me they go part and parcel um the reason because, so one step backwards, I guess, but um, when I graduated college, I, I lived in New York. I went to work, uh, worked in financial services and my first job out of college um, was like being a data analyst. And um, I spent all of my free time, I grew up on the internet and I spent all of my free time in New York going to meetups. And this was like 2014, 2015 New York. And the startup ecosystem was relatively young back then. Um, this was like heyday of a couple of fintech businesses around wealth management, so like Betterment and Wealthfront, um, BuzzFeed and like media. Um, Oscar was like a big company in like the health tech space at the time. But there just wasn't like a ton back then. Um, it was like still a relatively newer environment. Uh, but I found myself going to all these meetups and being so inspired by the people who were like building things. Um, and so I spent like literally all of my free time and like cold emailing founders in the New York area. Um, uh, like I, I look back and now it's kind of cringy because I would go onto like the app store and look up different like new app net apps and I and like the ones that were ones that I could try like consumery socially ones. Um, I would download them, use them for like a week or two. Um, and then I would write unsolicited feedback. <laughs> I would cold email unsolicited feedback. Um, and then like, Lo and behold, like a lot of those people ended up, you know, responding and ask, um, ask, like inviting me over for coffee. And uh, it was like a, an amazing way to like get to know like the tech, not like the early stage tech community. 
And that led me to San Francisco because all I wanted to do was like spend my time doing that basically. And so I thought to myself, I need to get to San Francisco because that seems to be where everything is happening. Um, and I want to go work at a startup. The uh, the <laughs> rude awakening moment was I had a really hard time getting a job in startups um, because I had, I was like I worked in financial services like I worked at this big company and nobody like I had no startup experience like my resume wasn't obvious um, I didn't study computer science um, and uh, like I wasn't an engineer like a software developer and so I just had a really hard time like getting a job I would get all the like I would get meetings and like get to meet these awesome people and then like at the 11th hour, they'd be like, oh, well, like, we love you. Like, you're awesome. But like, you know, um, there's not a role. There's not really a role for you here. Mm -hmm. uh, so I ended up kind of stumbling my way into venture because um, one of my old partners, Roy Bahat, um, worked with one of my old bosses uh, in New York a long time ago. And so he was like the only person that I like knew in startup land. Um and uh, I'm super grateful to him and the rest of the Bloomberg Beta team because they totally took a chance on me. And Roy in particular gave me incredibly brutally honest uh, ad advice at the time, just saying, you're not going to be able to get a job because you don't know anybody in this town. Um, and so if you and like this town works on it's a relatively small like ecosystem and it's very like trust and reputation based and if you really want to like get to know startups like really really like startup startups um not like twitter <laughs> um then come work for me and if you like hate it in like two years like you'll we'll help you find a job and like you'll be on your merry way um and so i'm super grateful to him because he totally took a chance on me and uh i ended up lo and behold like falling in love with the job um, I ended up like really enjoying my role and um, kind of like redefining like what venture meant to me because my preconception of it was like, oh, I don't know, like I'm not like a, I don't see, I don't see myself as like a finance person in that way. Um, I had a ton of friends back in New York who worked in private equity and hedge funds and, you know, I knew a lot of like, quote unquote, like investors. Um and oh, and I and I really considered myself like the first like two years of my venture career of myself as like a student of the craft and like really trying to learn the best practices from my partners at the firm and like other investors um, who had been doing it for a long time and like my friends, um, my peer, my peer set, and uh, yeah, and I found I found a tremendous amount of um, intellectual like joy, I guess, uh, in like meeting founders and understanding what they, what problem they wanted to solve and who they wanted to serve and seeing my role as an enabler of that, um, and helping them tell their story and unlocking, um, unlocking them. Like capital just happens to be a means to unlocking them. Yeah, that's great. It's a, it's a, it's a crazy, it's like, um, I mean, a the classic thing where it's like being in and being in both sides is kind of weird. But like, yeah, being in the kind of the, the closer to New York, like kind of you know fi finance world, um, and then yeah, it's like one of those classic. And it's a, just a reminder for all listeners that like anybody when they're trying to get any kind of job or any, like I remember when I was trying to work at MIT, it's like you just kind of show up and you just hang out and you're like, <laughs> and you chat with one person, you chat with Ethan, and Ethan's like, yeah, we don't really we're not really hiring right now, but maybe you should talk with Neha, and Neha's like, oh shit, like we we are hiring, you know, and so you kind of just just like you kind of um you go around and so and so that's that's helpful and it's also it's like um but yeah you, you kind of you receive no's and you just have to be in this mode where like i think i'm in the right place in the right rough niche um and so i'm just gonna keep on hanging out here you know and, and then see um if i can and help and then it is cool to have like um yeah there are those roles where it's like when you by existing there's like existing on the outside versus existing on the inside it's like once you start mm -hmm. you join bloomberg it was like okay now you were existing on the inside and now you could like totally yeah totally and the whole and the whole environment kind of shapes like it shifts around you um and going back to your original question about where does where does entrepreneurship intersect with community i think for myself um community played like two twofold one was it helped me get into tech um because i was going to these meetups and meeting all these interesting people and showing um that i could i, I had i could like access these people that like i like in just pure earnestness like muscled my way through to like meeting interesting people and then once i was in venture i really felt strongly that the people who knew who had the best insights um or rather, 
insights are best shared amongst practitioners. Like you get the best, like juiciest sort of like real time information about what's working and what's not, what's hard, what's easy. Um, when you get uh, small, typically like small ish groups of, um, of practitioners together. And so for my, like selfishly, I wanted to be in that room and the best way I could be in that room as a quote unquote, not practitioner, um, was to be the curator of that. Right. And so, I started hosting a lot of like dinners, like themed kind of eight to 12 person dinners around, you know, um, what, uh, like what's the current state of like open source software development. Um, uh, at the time, um, uh, when I was at Bloom Rubedo, we spent a lot of time looking at like machine learning applications and developer tools and, uh, part, like in large part influenced by the partner that I worked with, James Cham, who's incredible. Um, and, uh, just being like a, like a sponge, right? And inviting um, found like early stage entrepreneurs with like practitioners with template seizure experience and getting them in the same room and then seeding that room with the right set of like initial questions to get people talking, right? And then realizing like, oh, wow, like you have the same problem too. Um, and then that's where all the insights come through. Yeah. Uh, so it started kind of that way where it was a lot of like community building within within the Bloomberg beta portfolio and like beyond it. Um, and then uh, a couple friends and I, my friend Jen, um, Yip, who runs like it runs also is like an incredible community leader. Um, she uh, wanted to start like a robotics community, um, which didn't really exist at the time. It was how do you bring together some of the most technical people in Silicon Valley to share tactical insights around um, solving really challenging technical problems that interact with the real world, the physical world. Um, and she worked at a robotics company at the time. And so we collaborated and built out this community called Society. Uh, and it was kind of like this like quasi secret society of like probably like 200 of the top technical experts and um, experts who worked at Cruise and Applied Intuition and Skydio and all of these like hard tech quote unquote companies. Um, who were solving like really challenging problems around autonomy and perception and um, uh, like decision making, um, and that was inc that was such a great way to like learn. And so I guess like entrepreneurship for me with community intersects with like um, bringing the right people together to be able to like share those tactical insights, and that for me is like my mechanism of doing so. Cool. Yeah, it's, kind it's, of what I, you're doing, right? Like you're getting exposure in these like deep one-on-one -on -one conversations. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's like, and I think, well, I think, I think, well, I think that the deep one-on-one -on -one conversations is uh, related, and there is some pr probably some kind of community of, um, and if and when the the re show gets bigger, then it would be an actual like, then it becomes more of like a community around the thing, and then you can have like a, it's not just a pure parasocial relationship, but then the the people who are listeners are all hanging out or whatever. Um, and so, um, yeah, I th but I think I think for me, it's like more stuff like when I uh, help kickstart ETH Denver or whatever, it's like that kind of stuff. It's just like, let's bring all the people who are talking about ERC 721. Let's bring them in the same room. And like, they're going to just like practitioner it up, you know, and like chat about GitHub yeah. issues. And so that kind of energy makes a lot of sense. And it's, and it's also, I think it's a powerful, it makes me think of um, this uh, woman, Audrey Tang, and just her, you know, she sees herself as, um, and she's in Taiwan, she's as like a civic a tech person out there. And she sees herself yeah, as like yeah. being the channel through which, yeah, she's great. Um, the channel through which um, uh, people can speak through her. And so you're kind of the, the catalyzer thing where you're just like, you're just getting people in the same room, setting them roughly on the right trajectory. And then they start chatting instead of about the weather, they start chatting about these intense technical problems that they might have or kind of practitioner learnings that they can share. And then just like, and it's a win-win for everybody. Yeah. I mean, community is also one of those words that I think got, gets really overused, frankly. Um, mm -hmm. And sure, there are many interpretations of it, but I have a pretty strong opinion about what makes like great communities. Mm. Um, and they have like a couple, <laughs> uh, they, they just have a couple of core common attributes, right? I think great communities are a combination of shared purpose where the individuals participating have mutual influence on each other. There's, that, that's one. Two is there's some sense of like shared identity, and like a badge that you can wear um, to convey that you are a part of this group. Um, and then the third, I think, important thing is like a sense of ritual, right? What is the repeated or regular expected um, custom that you have? And 
the, the, the combination of those three things for, to me is what makes like really great community stand the test of time, right? And so you think about, um, you were mentioning writing club, that you come to writing club, which is amazing. Um, and there's a central sense of ritual around that and clear, clear purpose you come to write, right? And we like, the, you know, we say on Sundays we write. And that's very much the ritual, that there's a weekly cadence around it, almost like church, right? Um, and there's an identity around being able to say that you are a member of this. Um, I think like colleges work this way as well. Um, and then there's a host of like successful uh, versions of this where um, Weight Watchers even, right? Um, shared purpose, a ritual of getting together week on a regular cadence, um, a shared identity that you're all like part of this community. Um and so anything like that, um, that like, I don't think community is just bringing a bunch of people together and like sticking them in a room, right? Uh, as long as and, there's food and just, drink, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As in like, that's great. Like that's a great like networking opportunity. That's a great event. Um, mm -hmm. But those are point in time um, versus how does something become like really, really become a community? Yeah, I think, and it's funny because I think about yeah the word community here. It's like when you when I when I imagine that visually, the shared purpose, the shared identity, and then the ritual. It kind of it makes me feel like dent in the universe energy, where it's like you have this set of things that are kind of orienting in a direction. There's that that's the purpose, and the identity is like the agents, and then the 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 ritual is like mm -hmm. actually moving in that direction. And so it's a it's a thing. It's not just a community that's hanging out, blah blah. blah. It's like the direction is. Yeah, that it has some kind of um, yeah, vectorness there of, of direction. Yeah, but I have, I have a question for you, which is when you mm -hmm. think about, I feel like communities in some ways are these, you know, vector, you know, these like denting communities or whatever you want to call them, that they, I don't know, they, they kind of expand and then they contract and like, is that is that okay? Is that just part of the ball game? Or like, what have you learned about like community longevity over time, you know? Sure. Um, I think... So this might be, so some people disagree, might disagree with this, but um, I do think communities can be massive, right? Uh, as in like, I think, I do think communities can scale. That doesn't mean that they can't contract and expand like over time. Um, and so like the best example of like my own personal experience was this, um, was uh, being a member of and then working at On Deck, right? Um, and when I was a member, when I went through one of like the earliest like On Deck communities, it was like like the earliest days was like 2018 or something. Um, and there were 40 of us in a cohort and um, many of us are still friends. And it was such a great number, a great like caliber and quantity of people in like one um, shared event uh, that we all got to really get to know each other really well. And then um, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, On Deck is a startup community and a platform for, you know, aspiring entrepreneurs and uh, aspiring entrepreneurs to join to meet other um, very, very early stage, like idea stage uh, founders, uh, people who want to build things. And um, I joined them in 2021 to launch their uh, early stage accelerator, um, which for me was like a test of um, can we take this incredibly thriving community of what I think it was like 6,000 people or so at the time um, and channel that energy into, into accelerating kind of the subset of people who are high intention entrepreneurs and on a global scale. Um, and we did. Uh, and, you know, we built this incredible thing in like three months, which is like, I don't think I've, I, like, I've never worked so hard <laughs> in my life. Um, and like, what an incredible team we got to do it with. And we like put it out into the universe. And um, we had thousands of people come and apply. Um, that was actually also another uh, another like moment in time where I um, encountered immigration because we had entrepreneurs from Europe, Africa, Southeast Asia, you know, you name it. Like I met thousands of people from all over the globe who all wanted to like build companies and build things. Um, and so it, uh, to your question about like our community, is it okay for communities to like grow and then contract and so on and so forth? Like, absolutely. Um, you think about colleges and universities, um, they have a massive alumni bases. You think of churches um, across the country who like that would stand the test of time as well. I think the trick is that as communities grow, you need to help 
maintain a sense of closeness, like on a local scale. Um, I think companies are a really good example of this, where companies that grow really large, um, we were fortunate to be like at Bloomberg Beta, we were early investors in Flexport, for example. Flexport's a massive company now. It's been like almost 10 years. And um, it maintains a sense of like what it is like on the at the employee level because there's a shared identity and a culture that persists across the company and then each office might have its own flavor because the office in uh, Singapore is different than the office in San Francisco. Um, and, uh, and there are like local localized like leaders within each office, for example. Mm-hmm. I think I can't remember exactly who it was, uh, but there's, there's like a great, podcast, I can't remember about how Stripe did this as well, where as mm. Stripe started to scale, um, each local office maintained a sense of it's what makes it special, right? And so all of the snacks inside the Tokyo office were like, cult, you know, like the local snacks in Japan versus like the ones in London. Um, and so while everyone shared this identity about like Stripe as a community and as a collective, um, each office got to maintain its sense of uh, own identity. And so it got to have like a badge of its own. Cool. Yeah, that's interesting. It's like, yeah, you. I think what I'm hearing a lot of that. Well, a, I'll ask um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to have Claire on the podcast soon, who just wrote scaling people, and so I'll ask her about the um, how oh, they did amazing. different um, different things there. Uh, and I, I think it's yeah, the communities are multi scale by nature. And then the other thing that I might add to them is like, there's the shared purpose. Shared, and this is kind of like a mimetic perspective, right? But like shared purpose, shared identity, shared ritual, and then there needs to be a value in order for the thing to self propagate. It needs to be making. It needs to like um, either it, ha- it may be making money or be like pulling in attention, some amount of capital, whether it's financial capital or something else. It's like you can have some shared purpose, identity and ritual, but then if that thing is hanging out for a bit, but then it doesn't have, it doesn't continue to capture the um, hearts and minds or capture financial things, then it kind of naturally right. dissipates. And so you kind of, uh, and that's why some of these startup companies or communities or whatever are so powerful because they have the kind of money on the back end. Um, but I want I want to ask a question here and kind of transition to the you talked about immigration stuff and and I do want to chat about that because there's nothing that's when I I just <laughs> the immigration system is such bullshit you know and so whether it is the um uh, at the at the, the lower level I had these um folks who lived. Uh, my house is kind of like this restorative justice house. A, a bunch of formerly, it's formerly incarcerated, former lifers live with me. And then we also are like a place where um, we have uh, these three, these two folks from uh, Africa, West Africa, who are homosexuals who are running away from uh, that. And they, they were refugees and they were, they had temporary asylum. And it was just like hearing about those things. It was just like, oh my God, so frustrating. And then the other side is like, I was at this um, uh, party in the marina recently. I've, I will never go to another party in the marina. Um <laughs> Um, just because I'm not, I don't have that energy, no offense to anybody at the party, but just the MBA energy or whatever. So, um, and, uh, but they were, but there were people who were at the party who are from all around the world, from Egypt and other places. And they were just talking about, and these are people who, who went to random Ivy league schools and are working at Google's and stuff. And they just, and they're still dealing with immigration bullshit, you know? And I'm just like, oh my God, the whole thing is just bad. So tell us about, um, what Plymouth is and how you guys are helping. <laughs> sure. Oh gosh. Um, I have so many thoughts on what you just shared. Um, so um, my co-founder and I are both um, come from startup backgrounds, startup and venture backgrounds. And so we started an organization called Plymouth Street, where we help the world's top talent navigate U.S. immigration with much more transparency and speed. Um, the reason that I think immigration is important, not only is there you know a lot of personal ties to this myself, um, having seen it time and time again, but I do, I, gen, I genuinely just believe that in order for a country to maintain its its technological leadership and economic leadership, um, you need to welcome people like some of the best people from all over the globe, right? And America benefits from the gift of global talent, like more than anybody else in the world right now. And I think going back to like the beginning of this conversation, like I think if you don't protect it, and if you don't defend it and continue to encourage people to come here and stay here and build here, um, over time, the like the the output of the country, like the, you know, the production of the co- of the country ceases to exist, right? Um, and so on just like a macro on principle, I just feel really strongly that the that America was founded upon the backs of immigrants and um, to not continue to welcome people from all sorts of different backgrounds, from all sorts of different educational uh, pedigrees is a disservice um, to us being able to build. Yeah. 100%. Um, and, and 
to your uh, to your um, like the experiences that you've had, I do think one of the challenges right now to the broad conversation is that high skilled immigration gets like lumped into every other form of immigration, um, both at a cultural like conversational level and also like political level. And so it it actually makes it a little bit harder to sometimes. Um, uh, make progress on immigration because all of these like asylum, refugees, high skilled, mid skilled, like all of those conversations get muddled up together. Totally, totally. Yeah, it's weird. It all goes under immigration, um, which is kind of a tough thing. So, so tell us about from and, and you don't have to as a note to listeners. It's like you know, men is working on this. It, it's still they're still an alpha, you know. So they're still kind of exploring <laughs> this, and so they can't. Um, you can't share all of your secret sauce yet, or whatever. We'll but share like, more. So, we'll share more of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're getting, we're getting, we're getting that. Um, yeah, an alpha leak, which is exciting, but we can't get the full alpha leak. So, so tell us about. So, what is. So I guess just to give us a flavor of it, it's like, okay, what is what are the issues with current U.S. immigration and, and what are some things either that you guys are doing or some other countries that do it well? Yeah, I mean, oh, gosh, where so during the Trump administration, um, immigration just went down the tank. Basically, we went from issuing 11 million visas a year, I think, in 2020 or something, 2019. Um uh, to a couple of years later, we were only issuing like three and a half um, million visas. So, you know, that's a dramatic decline. Um, I might have gotten those years like a little bit off by, but um, that that number is pretty directionally correct. And um, and a big uh, and again, that's like total immigration um, just around visas. Uh, but you could but that gives you a sense for, you know, how much more restrictive we became. And at the same time, you had countries like Canada and the UK and Portugal announce, hey, everybody is welcome. And so, you know, like the UK launched a global talent visa for um, individuals who come from like a lot of elite institutions and like really good school academic backgrounds basically get a very like fast pass into the country. Um, Portugal during COVID launched a startup visa that to say, hey, if you want to build in Portugal and you have entrepreneurial ambitions, like we're going to make it super easy for you to do so. Um, Canada obviously has always been like fair, quite, quite open to like entrepreneurs and like people who are starting their careers. Um, building businesses. And so you have all these countries like all over the globe welcoming people from different backgrounds to them whilst America is saying no um, and, and and actively like sending people, like deporting people, right? Or sending them away or making it, uh, making processing times like three, 10 years. Uh, so where do I begin? I mean, I, for me, I think like with Plymouth, we wanted to start with who are the people that we know best and who are the people that we, we can serve immediately, um, that we are credible, that we can credibly serve. And that happened to be sort of the tech talent community. It was like a lot of entrepreneurs and like early engineers and like high, um, like STEM talent um, who at these like fast growing companies and many of whom um, fall into probably like one, like one of two or three different archetypes, one being you're at a company and you are maybe on an H-1B, which is the lottery-based um, visa, and want to go and work at an early stage startup or maybe go start something of your own and you're locked in because you're not really exactly sure what visa is possible for me, right? So that's like one archetype. The other one is maybe you're um, coming from overseas and you know you want to get to the, you want you want to come build in the US, but you're not really sure how to do that either. And so what what goes beyond the visitor visa? Like how, how can I stay here and build a business or work at an early stage company um, that can sponsor me, um, that isn't just leaving my life up to chance. Um, so those kind of like two core archetypes are ones that I feel like, well, I know who those people are. Like those people exist in my network. Those are my friends. Um, so we kind of started there. And um, I think the big, like big impact, impactful kind of opportunity here is if you start with some of the very best people in the world who are at the forefront of technological innovation, then you get to model for the rest of the country, hopefully, that um, these are uh, that we want more people like this, right? Um, and thankfully, the Biden Harris administration actually announced a couple of agency actions um, last year that said, "Hey, there are these like underused visas. Um, we should expand the usage of them, and so please go do so." Uh, so that's kind of like 
where like the area that we play in. Um, and I think it ties in a lot with uh, just more people should understand what options are available to them. Because I think one of the biggest challenges that I've certainly observed with um, with building Plymouth and um, my co-founder went through her own immigration journey and um, the people that we get to work with, it's kind of this like incredibly opaque process. And you get a ton of it can be quite, um, how do I put it? Like the process feels very defeating because it feels like every ta- every turn you take, there's not a path. And what I am hopeful of is that if we, if we can play the guide of helping you understand that there are paths that we can explore, um, uh, there's like, there's a way, right? Yeah. Um, there's a way. And yep. long term, I think if you are able to show that, hey, these are people at the forefront of AI, of biotech, of life sciences, of aerospace and defense, like these are literally the people who are rebuilding America, then um, hopefully that paves the path to be able to show um, whether it's policy or, you know, politicians or um, leaders and other uh, leaders in the tech community. Um, it kind of galvanizes everybody around to say, oh, yeah, this is possible. We should totally be supporting that. Cool. Yeah, I like that. It's um, well, hey, just in knowing the numbers is sad. It's one of those things where it's like, you know, when when uh, when Trump was elected and I'm not some kind of uh, I, I'm not a registered Democrat or a Republican or whatever. But yeah, when Trump was like, it was just like the downsides of just like, oh, the Supreme Court's gonna and it's like, yep, there's gonna be a Roe v. Wade thing, you know, or whatever. It's like and then the similar one with the immigration stuff where it's not just like, it's not just Trump hanging out. to It's like, no, there's all these just like, essentially low quality um, uh, bureaucrats that then made these low quality things. It's just like, oh, my God, from 11 million to 3 million. No, that's like, you don't want that. Um, So that's sad. And yeah, I think, I mean, I just, yeah, as you said, knowing those people, one of my friends who's worked at Fidelity for a long time, and he just, he's such a startup energy. He has so much. And he's just mm-hmm. like, but I literally cannot. I'm in the like Indian waiting line. I've been there for 10 years, you know, and like, and I can't, if I yeah. wanted to go do something else, I like, I have to, I'm like, my H1B is through Fidelity, you know, so it's like, I'm being protected by the system. And so, and those things <laughs> for the listeners, I would every word that Min was saying, you know, not it was. I was just like, I, I was just like, <laughs> eye rolling and frustrated. I was just like, and then that and like the opaqueness and the. It's so crazy. It's so bad. But so that sounds good. That there's making it less opaque, making it more transparent, helping people fast track people through it. So tell me from like a. I want to, I want like the big picture here, the kind of abundance agenda, kind of raising the bar. Like, what's the winning coalition that we're going to be able to do? Like. 20 years from now, what should a like high skilled um, immigration look like in the U.S.? Oh, gosh. Um, well, one, before I, an- I answer, mm-hmm. Alec Stop and Caleb Watney are the co-founders of the Institute for Progress. And I will I must give them a shout out because they have produced incredible research and writing about this this very specific topic. Um, and they're big partners with us at Plymouth. And so, and I'm super grateful for their support. Um, so I must give them a shout out because if you, if you want to learn anything about high scale immigration, the two of them have written at length about it. Um, uh, Noah Smith as well, um, for what it's worth. And so all of those pieces are, will do far better justice than I can. But, um, if I were to answer 20 years from now, I mean, low-hanging fruit things, right? Where we people come here because we have some of the best educational institutions in, in the world. Um, every single person graduating with an advanced degree um, in any STEM field, and STEM should be interpreted like super broadly, right? Because we have all these emerging industries and, uh, that should be, that should count towards, you know, whether it's like cloud computing or quantum or, um, you know, different, different subsectors of machine learning, um, all of those count or should count within like the STEM interpretation and every single person graduating with like an advanced, Hey, why not even just a degree, right? Any degree should be able to stay here for much longer than they do today. Right, um, a lot of a lot of students with those STEM fields get to stay here on OPT um, if they uh, up to which I believe is up to three, um, up to five for certain certain fields. Um, but yeah, everybody should get like green cards basically. <laughs> um, that's one where we should reward the people who come here to advance their academic careers to be able to stay here and apply that academic insight to their professional careers. Um, I think. Anyone who has entrepreneur, I think there, there's been a 20 year 
initiative and effort around um, expanding like what is like the entrepreneur startup visa effectively in the U.S. Um, and I think that has like come and gone, frankly, right? Because it's like a huge policy upheaval, um, up, uh, overhaul. But hopefully in the next like 20 years, like if I could wave a magic wand, like that would be incredible that people who want to start businesses have a path of doing so here, um, uh, which is much faster and easier. I, I, I genuinely think that when my parents and I came here, my dad started a company in South Korea and moved us over here by establishing like a subsidiary so that he could come in on like an executive visa as a foreign a foreign corporation. Um, but I but that but that's like a workaround, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and uh, in in reality, I think that if we tried to do that today, that would be incredibly difficult and challenging, um, and that shouldn't necessarily be the case. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah, got it. so yeah, it's um. And it's just simple things. It's like some some of those are just so yeah. As you said, the low hanging fruits like acad. If you're here and you spend six years on some biotech PhD and you know all about that and you want to do work here, what, what kind of idiot yeah. country would you would would say no? You have to leave pretty soon. You know, it's like what are you doing? Oh my god. So so uh, that all sounds good. Thank you for your service, and I hope it all goes well. I want to ask a final as we wrap here. Um, a quick little overrated underrated. Um, which is, uh, I'll just ask the thing and you'll say, you know, your whether it's overrated or underrated, and then you will, um, give like a one sentence for why. Uh, so do you think that working in the U S is overrated or underrated? Oh, underrated, underrated. Totally. Why? Come here. <laughs> oh, why? Oh, um, I still think that likelihood of outsized opportunity is here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's a nice graph uh, from someone recently about just like the amount of patents made by people, like when they're in their foreign country, and then they come, you know, here to this high skill place. And then if they stay here, they have like three patents per year. Well, if they go back home, it goes back down to like, well, you know, like two or whatever. so it's like, so yeah, it's very, um, very helpful. Uh, what about what about San Francisco specifically? Is that um, overrated or underrated as a hub for talent? Wildly underrated. I think I know that might be a little bit um, not the most popular, but I think that if you're kind of weird and you like tech and you want to build stuff, you still come to San Francisco. Um, everybody I know who is early career still wants to come here. I think it changes over time as you grow and hopefully you find success, right? And then you can live in Miami if you want. Great. Um, go forth. But um, I've been long SF for a long time now, and I still continue to believe that it is still the very best place for techno optimistic buildery type people to come 100 percent, yeah i pretty much i think there's like a 75 percent chance i live here the rest of my life which is cool um <laughs> what about the um what the final one is what about the like the frustrations of us or the badness of us immigration overrated underrated. it's also underrated yeah i mean i think a lot of people who haven't been in this space, um, even I'm like, you know, getting up to speed on like all the work that's happened over the last like several decades. Um, and it is incredibly frustrating, but also like such an opportunity to like really change the narrative around how we see immigration, how we encourage more people to come here and stay here and build here. Um, and so I, I actually think the tech community, like Silicon Valley writ large, is still not seeing what a huge opportunity of taking advantage of immigration is for attracting and retaining the very best talent. Um, like com like corporations that have existed for 50 plus years use it as a, as a strategic advantage when it comes to hiring and startups for lack of resources most of the time, um, but like just have no insight into this process at all. And oftentimes like miss out on being able to hire exceptional people because they just have no idea and their default path is putting people up to a lottery. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. It's like, yeah, the big, there's some kind of regulatory capture there or something where it's like these big companies, they have the ability to do like to deal with the visa system. And then hopefully what you're building is a thing where it's like if for any startup, like anybody, and not every startup needs to have their own immigration lawyers, but like it is possible to have a, um, you know, an API for immigration that then, you know, the startups can <laughs> click and then it uh, allows people to actually come to the States. Um, yeah. So love that. I think that's exciting. Um, as we wrap, so again, thank you, Min, for coming on the show. I want to say a couple things to the listeners. A is um, feel free to check out Min on the Twitters. Um, she is at Minicat. So um, 
at M I N N E Y underscore C A T. Uh, do you like cats, by the way? What's the what's the cat what's the cat deal? I do love cats. <laughs> I like cats too. I have I have two cats. Um, they're not in my room right now, but hopefully they'll come onto a different show. Um, if you are a person who is experiencing the immigration bullshit, then. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> go to feel free to go to plymouthstreet.org um and check that out or just uh, hit up men um men anything else you want to say to our listeners today uh thank you so so much for having me on um this was such a delight and get, uh, great to meet you Reese. um i would encourage people to write great cold emails because that's how reese found me um and this is such a pleasure and that's how i ended up meeting some of like my my mentors my greatest friends like in san francisco um a great cold email goes a long way hit people up always hit people up yeah um good <laughs> well that thank you so much thanks so much for listening today if you like the show please give us a five-star podcast review or subscribe on youtube And if you'd like to chat about this episode with a community of amazing, smart, ambitious, divergent people, come on by and join our Discord. You can find it at root.co. That's R-O-O-T-E dot co. And then finally, if you'd like to contribute to these ideas being shared more widely in society, you can support the podcast production team at patreon.com slash Reese Lindmark. That's patreon.com slash R-H-Y-S-L-I-N-D-M-A-R-K. Thanks, and see you here for the next episode. Bye.